Welcome back, friends. This is Syracuse Sports. My name is Brent Axe, and this is the sequel, part two of Axe Brent Anything. The episodes where we turn the show over to you, our Syracuse Sports Insiders. You ask the questions, I answer the questions. It's a beautiful thing. Now, that's a bit of a misnomer because our Syracuse Sports Insiders are always welcome to ask questions for this podcast, to ask questions of me, because as a Syracuse Sports Insider, you get direct text message access to me anytime on anything. If I have breaking news, you're going to get it first. You're going to get my opinions first. I'm going to send you guys questions and thoughts and get your feedback and what you want to hear on future episodes of Syracuse Sports. We just put out a a vote for you guys. So we're going to start doing some drafts here on Syracuse Sports. A lot more because I love to do drafts and I love to make lists and have conversations like that. I said, okay, what should we kick this off with? And I put it out to the Syracuse Sports Insiders and you guys voted on it. So coming soon, we are going to draft the all-time Syracuse basketball starting five. And I'm going to bring in a couple of special guests for that. It's going to be fun. That's what being a Syracuse Sports Insider is all about. You help drive this bus. And to become a Syracuse Sports Insider, it's so easy. All you got to do is text the word ORANGE to 315-847-3895. Try it free for two weeks. And after that, just three ninety nine dollars a month, less than a buck a week to get all that great Syracuse sports information and to have direct text access to me. So as mentioned, this is part two. If you missed part one, well, that means you probably need to subscribe to the podcast. Make sure you do that on Spotify, on Apple, on our Syracuse Orange Sports, on YouTube page. However you get your podcast, make sure you subscribe and follow and new episodes will come your way. Uh, If you uh, did miss part one, want to check it out. It's right in the show notes of this episode let's get right back to it and your amazing questions and we're going to lead off today with brian d who says as a fellow syracusan who was born and raised with the success of the syracuse football program during the late 80s and 90s uh, given the landscape that is college football do you think that syracuse will ever win an acc championship or compete in the college football playoff it's funny you mentioned that brian they just put out the format for the now 12-team college football playoff. Yesterday, it starts December 20th, right on through to the national championship game, which is a month later. The college football playoff is now going to be a process of about a month. And the answer to your question is yes, absolutely. Why not? And here's what makes me believe that. Now, Fran Brown has yet to coach a game, so let's not put the cart before the horse here, folks. But he is in the conversations that Syracuse football has not been in for years. When you see the lists come out of the recruits and Syracuse is on lists with Miami and Penn State and Alabama and Florida and Florida State, when you can get a Kyle McCord and a Fidel Diggs, just to name a couple, to come to Syracuse, you have the connections, you know how to work the portal, the NIL money is improving. And the reason you can now answer this question, yes, it's a 12-team playoff. You're telling me that Syracuse can't be that second team or maybe even the third team from the ACC that gets in. It's a power four now, guys. It's not a power five. And I get that the SEC and the Big Ten rule, but I do think Syracuse can have that year. And it's considerably harder for Syracuse to have that year than, say, a Clemson or a Florida State. But even Clemson went four and four in the ACC last year. Dabo Swinney continues to mock the transfer portal and won't use it. So, hey, you do your thing, man. But The answer is absolutely they can, but I think we all understand, even with those new advantages that are out there, it's a lot harder for Syracuse to do. Here's the other thing, and I'm not saying they're going to make the playoff this year, but you need a break in the schedule. Syracuse does not play Florida State this year. They do not play Clemson this year. They do not play North Carolina this year, right? They've got the break in the schedule they need, get in the ACC championship game, potentially into the playoff i do think we're going to see it brian and i believe that more now than i have in in a long long time matt says do you consider art monk to be the greatest pro wide receiver to come out of syracuse and i like how you frame that matt the greatest pro wide receiver to come out of syracuse because if we're ranking just the greatest syracuse wide receivers and what they did here i mean you got some great names there you have art monk you have marvin harrison you have quadria smile you have shelby hill uh, Rob Moore, Scott Schwades, Alec Lemon is third all-time 
in in yards and is up there at 18 touchdowns. A, a underrated name. He was instrumental in that 2012 season when Syracuse had a great year with Ryan Nassib at quarterback, right? But per your question, I'll put it back here on the screen quickly. Do you consider Art Monk to be the greatest pro wide receiver to come out of Syracuse? Look, I love Art Monk. And uh, for a long time, I campaigned on my radio show to get Art Monk into the Pro Football Hall of Fame because it was just absurd that he was not in. He eventually did get in, but it took way too long for a guy who at one time I think had more catches than anybody to get into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, right? But if we're talking about the best pro receiver to come out of Syracuse, it's undoubtedly Marvin Harrison. Marvin Harrison had 128 career touchdowns. He is top 10 in receiving yards, and I get they played in different eras. Art Monk had different quarterbacks. He certainly went through a couple of Super Bowls, won a couple of Super Bowls, but just didn't have that consistent, you know, like Marino or a Jim Kelly, or in Marvin Harrison's case, he had Peyton Manning. That helps to be in that offense and have the same guy for the entire bulk of your career. So you have to go Marvin Harrison just because of the numbers, but I would put Art Monk as a 1A, and you have to consider the different eras that they played. And Rob Moore is right up there as well. But a great question from Matt. From Josh. Says, hey, Brent, we're the same age, and it sounds like the soundtrack to your teenage years is a lot like mine. Rank these lead singers in order, worst to first. Lane Staley, Eddie Vedder, Kurt Cobain, Chris Cornell, Scott Weiland, and Billy Corgan. Okay. To go from worst to first on that list, I don't know if I can do that because they're all excellent. So we'll do that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go by the standards of the question and go up the list here. But let me just say this right off the bat. They're all amazing. They all are uh, at Hall of Famers, trendsetters. Uh, in the case of you know Kurt Cobain and Nirvana, I mean, come on, they changed music as we know it. Not every band you can have a great band that sells a lot of albums, sells out concerts, and will be a name that sticks out in their format in their era. But not everybody can say that they turn music on its head, and that's what Kurt Cobain and Nirvana did. So all of these lead singers, all of these bands that they have been in, and there's been several in some cases all made their mark here. So I want to say that respectfully off the top here, but I like the question. So let's get into it. Uh, at number six on that list, I'd have Billy Corgan. I'm not a huge Smashing Pumpkins guy. I respect what they did. I love Drown. Um, I, there's a couple of songs that pop up, some of the earlier Smashing Pumpkins stuff. Uh, Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness is an incredible album that would have to be up there if you're ranking the great grunge albums and the great 90s albums, right? But on this list, I'm going to put Billy sixth, okay? At number five on this list, man, this gets hard. I'll probably go Lane Staley. And, man, I love Lane Staley. And, boy, what a tragic life he lived. And, unfortunately, we lost him. And he just battled addiction throughout his uh, his music career and through his life. Go watch Unplugged. And I don't think of anybody on this list. You feel the songs more than when Lane Staley puts the pain and the emotion into the songs that he sings. And that's an incredible story of how Alice and Chain showed up at that Unplugged, and there was a lot of people there that weren't feeling well that night, and they just they absolutely knocked it out of the park. The, the Unplugs of the 90s are just some of my favorite music of all time, and Lane just really hits home and hits that core almost more than anybody on this list. Okay? So... Here's where I would put Kurt Cobain. I'm not a huge Nirvana guy. I never was. I was always more of a Pearl Jam guy, but you have to respect what Kurt Cobain and Nirvana did. They changed music as we know it, right? And they didn't want all the commercial success that came with it, and it just got out of hand. But you got to respect the fact that my daughter, okay, is an example of this. My daughter here in 2024, who is 17 years old, listens to Nirvana as if they're still on the radio and they're still the band that, that came along like I was back in the early 90s. So all respect to Kurt Cobain. I'm just not a huge Nirvana guy, but I got to put him on that list in a respectable place, right? But now I think we're getting into the top three. Scott Weiland at Stone Temple Pilots. All things considered, probably the best front man in this group. The range, listen to Scott Weiland saying plush, the fast version, if you will, listen to him sing it acoustically. 
Wylan had more energy on stage than almost any one of these guys, and, and they all had a lot of energy. Eddie Vedder in particular here, who we'll talk about here in a second. But, man, pound for pound, STP, Wyland, he was in some other bands, some of the solo stuff that he did, and, again, another guy who just tragically battled addiction throughout his life, um, had some of the best looks on stage that you would see, and, man, just another underrated unplugged. When people talk about the great unplugs of all time, they don't mention Stone Temple Pilots enough. That unplugged was amazing from start to finish. So our top two, Eddie Vedder, I'm going to put it number two. Sustainability, by the way, Dark Matter is an incredible album. I mean, boy, I can't believe they put out an album like that so many years later. Wreckage is, is one of the best Pearl Jam songs ever put out, in my opinion. And they're doing that, you know, 30 some odd years later. It's incredible. But Eddie is the consummate professional front man. He went from kind of the rebel that's hanging from the scaffolding and, you know, writing stuff on his arm during Unplugged and taking on Ticketmaster to he's he's kind of the established veteran now. He's kind of like your cool uncle who's still in a band. Great sports fan, of course, as well. Um, Eddie is, I mean, come on. He's a legend. But number one on this list is is absolutely Chris Cornell. And I know that Josh was not going to be happy with me if I didn't pick Chris Cornell. Look, the range for Chris Cornell and we'll we'll get to your question here shortly. Think of Chris Cornell when he was in Soundgarden singing Black Hole Sun and singing uh, Rusty Cage and and that style of music too. He put out one of the best covers of all time covering Sinead O'Connor's Nothing Compares to You. Think of Sun Shower. Sun Shower is one of my all-time favorite songs. Uh which I would also put on the list, the single soundtrack in my opinion is the greatest soundtrack ever put out maybe other than Purple Rain right? Seasons. Think of Seasons by Chris Cornell, kind of like Lane Staley, those songs that hit you emotionally. But he was amazing in Soundgarden, great solo artist. Audio Slave is a great band and another guy that we lost just way, way too soon. So there you go. Love talking some grunge. I could do many podcasts on that. But uh, Josh, I appreciate that question. Will jumps back into the football fray here and says, Brent, what's the one Syracuse football game that got away? Well, for me, Will, and I would love to hear the feedback from you guys out there, and I guess it's generational, it's got to be that Sugar Bowl in 1988 off of the 1987 season. And look, put aside Pat Dye cowardly kicking that field goal to tie the game, to tie the Sugar Bowl, right? There was an opportunity before that, and I did a video about this. You guys can check it out on YouTube. We did a, it was at the time, the 30th anniversary of the 1987 undefeated team. And I remember talking to several players on that team, but the guy that really stands out to me is a former Orangeman, Blake Bednars, a great dude who I, I still talk to from time to time now. And Blake brought up the fact, so quick, go back to 87. Last game of the year, West Virginia, Syracuse is down by two. They come back on the field. They run the two-point conversion with Michael Owens, which is still the loudest I have ever heard the Dome and probably ever will, right? They went for it. They talked about it in the huddle. Everybody unquestionably said, no, we're going for this. We're not tying the game. You could have tied the game, kept everything in play, held an undefeated season, still went to a great bowl game because you could tie in football back then. But they went for it. So why didn't they go for it in that Sugar Bowl? Because before Pat Dye tied the game, Syracuse had an opportunity in what was a low-scoring tight game. Remember, the final score of that game was 16-16. They had a chance to go for it in that fourth quarter on a fourth down and everybody wanted to go but coach mac didn't go for it then that gave auburn the opportunity to tie the game but that is unquestionably to me the one that got away i mean they win that game i'm not saying they win the national championship because remember you had to be voted into being the national champion that year and i still don't think they would have got there but it would have helped their case if they won that game but 11 0 and 1 man can't take that away from him. Timmy C wants to know, who do you think is the leading candidate to start a quarterback in 2025? Tim, can I say he's not on the roster, right? Because if you had asked me this question the day after Syracuse ended their season last year, I would not have said Kyle McCord. As much as we knew that Syracuse had to go into the portal, had to up the competition in the quarterback room, and knew they were going to bring in a name or two. I didn't think they'd get a guy on the level of Kyle McCord to come in. That still may be the case for next season after McCord plays his one season at Syracuse, right? 
But of the guys we know about, I'm going to narrow it down to either Jakari Williams or Luke Carney. And I think Williams wins out just because he's going to have another year, right? So Luke Carney is a quarterback that this coaching staff really likes. He's put up huge numbers in the state of Texas, by the way. He fits kind of the mold 6'2". Uh, he really fits that offense that Jeff Nixon, Syracuse's new offensive coordinator who also recruited him, and that pro style he wants to put into place. Jakari's going to have the opportunity to be around for a year, be behind McCord, learn the offense, integrate himself into the offense. Though remember, he was not recruited by Fran Brown. He was a Dino recruit that was held over by the current staff. But given the importance of upping the competition in the quarterback room, the type of offense that they have, their willingness to go into the portal, I don't think he's on the roster right now. I don't think he's somebody that's on our radar right now. So who's the leading candidate to start a quarterback in 2025? Let's just say we don't know who that person is, meaning he's he's not on the roster nor on Syracuse's radar at this point. From Sandra, says, Brent, what's your favorite song to dance to? The one you just can't sit still when it comes on. Oh my God, you're going to make me pick one. So let me let me tell you a, a funny story about that. So the other day, my wife and I were at Trader Joe's and um, I would do this anyway. If you see me at Wegmans on a Sunday morning, depending on what the Wegmans DJ is playing, there is a very good chance I'm going to belt out what's on the speakers. I'm going to be whistling. I'm going to be singing. I'm going to be bopping. It's what I do, man. I don't mind. I just, I'm, I'm into it, right? At a wedding, I'm dancing to pretty much everything. I don't get why people go to weddings and just sit on their ass the whole time. Like, what are you doing, right? So you have all those traditional wedding songs, you know, the shout song and YMCA and all that stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm all in. I, I'm not a good dancer. I'm not going to sit here and tell you I'm a good dancer. I don't know the electric slide after all these years. I don't know any of those things. The Cupid shuffle. I don't know those things. I don't, but I just, I just dance along. Right. So, but to go back to my story. We were at Trader Joe's the other day and Control by Janet Jackson came on. And I do like to mess with my wife here, but I, I was like legit dancing. I was kind of bopping, you know, th through the aisles, you know, and, and she just, she just read with embarrassment. Right. So I will do that. But man, if you're going to make me pick one, I got to go with it takes two. Rob Bass, who does not just want to get up and dance every time they hear that song. And I don't have the license to play commercial music here. By the way, you guys have been sending me your music, and I'm going to incorporate that into the pod coming soon. I know some of you have been asking about that. Hang with me. We're working on it. Um, but I can't play commercial music that we don't have a license to. But just picture that in your head. Pull it up on your computer, on your phone. Listen to that right now. If you don't hear It Takes Two by Rob Bass and DJ Easy Rock, and you don't want to get up and just move your feet, I can't help you. I can't help you. That would be right at the top of my list. From Frankie, Frankie F. Brent, how good is Kion Anthony, really? And how much of it is hype because of his dad? Hashtag Bronny James. Bronny James, who's going to get drafted by the Lakers probably when he averaged like five points per game last year and by no means is a pro prospect. But hey, you go, kid. Uh, Kion Anthony's a real deal. He is a player, and he's only getting better. I have heard a number of interviews lately with – the recruiting guys that are out there, they're at the tournaments, they're watching these players. We can all watch YouTube highlights. We can all watch what's on social media. These are carefully constructed highlight videos that these guys put on social media. You have to be very careful about that. Okay. I want to, and we will on the pod during the summer, but talk to the guys and listen to the guys that go to the tournaments. They see the good, the bad, and the ugly and everything in between. Anthony is only getting better and he's an established shooter right now. Look, you're going to come in. You got to shoot the ball. You got to shoot the rock, right? He can shoot the rock and he's getting better at the other elements of his game. I think if you watch Kion, he's going to have his good moments. He's going to have his bad moments, just like any player his age. But Sadiq White, Syracuse's 2025, uh, their first recruit that they brought in, of course, who was a top 30 prospect, he's recruiting Kion Anthony. They would be a powerhouse backcourt if they came in together. So. Brent's crystal ball is certainly calling for Kion Anthony to come to Syracuse. He is going to take some other visits, Ohio State, Indiana. I think I saw this week is some spots he's targeting here, but he is not Bronny James. He He's getting hype because of his dad. That's going to happen, but he is a legit player. And uh, 
think you're going to be seeing him at Syracuse starting in 2025. From Talesia, says, Brent, when you go out for ice cream, what's your go-to and where's your favorite place to go get ice cream? Oh, these are two fantastic questions, especially for this time of the year. All right, so Talesia, my go-to is mint chocolate chip or coffee. The other day I got bittersweet symphony, I believe it's called. It's a, a Perry's ice cream. Out of this world. Out of this world coffee ice cream. Shout out to them, right? By the way, the best mint chocolate chip ice cream is Turkey Hill, and I will not take any other candidates, okay? But I got to tell you about my favorite ice cream place. If you are ever in Saranac Lake, Lake Placid, kind of that area, you have to go to Donnelly's. So Donnelly's is an ice cream place in Saranac Lake. And <laughs> I'm just laughing thinking about it because there's a couple of unique things about it. One, they serve one flavor a day. That's it. You show up, it's chocolate, it's vanilla, it's twist, it's whatever they feel like making that day. It's only soft serve. The machine they serve it out of is literally from the 1930s, I believe. Like it is old school. You see this ice cream machine and it is as old school as it gets. One flavor a day. It's amazing. And here's the thing. You might drive by and be like, oh, I don't like peach ice cream. Sometimes they kind of experiment with the flavors a little bit. Now, on a Friday and a Saturday night, they're they're going, you know, you got to give the people what they want. Twist, chocolate, vanilla, right? But they'll try different things. So... The reason I know about Donnelly's is my family and I like to go to Rainbow Lake every couple of years, which is not too far from where Donnelly's is in Saranac Lake. We go to Donnelly's every day when we're in Rainbow Lake. So sometimes you pull up and like today's flavor is peach. I'm like, I don't like peach ice cream, but you will like it at Donnelly's. So thank you for that question, Talicia. If you are ever anywhere near there, I implore you to go to Donnelly's. It is the best ice cream you will ever have. While we're on that theme, my guy, Danny P says, Brent, what's your favorite thing to do in summer in central New York? Well, to go back to that old commercial, you know, it's summer when they're rocking in Weedsport, right? I, I love those commercials. Metallica at the Weedsport Fairgrounds. You know, it's summer when they're rocking in Weedsport, right? But that is my favorite thing to do in the summer, concerts. Now, the concert lineup I've seen so far, I'm not going to lie, kids, it's not tickling Uncle Brent's fancy here. Last year was an all-timer. Last year, there were so many great concerts around here. Counting Crows, who are coming back. I don't know if I'm going to go to that one again. I love Counting Crows. They can be a little tricky live, though. In one week, I saw Better Than Ezra, Sponge, and Collective Soul which was just an all-timer run. And I know that you can't group the concerts together like that, but I'm not just talking about the big shows at like the amphitheater or one of the great things about being in central New York, I talked about in part one, you're two, three, four hours from anywhere. So if there's big concerts at Fenway Park or in Toronto or in Buffalo or in New York City, you can go to those, right? But just the live music that's around here every day during the summer, right? I live not too far from a golf course. They have live music every Wednesday. I can just sit on my porch and listen to it, right? So my big thing is concerts. I love to go to concerts in the summer, but going out on the boat, mostly on Oneida Lake, but, you know, we'll take it other places. Uh, just salt potatoes and corn and those, uh, you know, Hoffman hot dogs. Uh, I'll eat Hoffman hot dogs 365 days out of the year, but it, it hits different in the summer. Those summer foods that you eat when the corn is you know when it's good when the, you know you get corn on the cob now what are we doing here you got to get it when it's you know really ripe and really in season kind of late july early august is when it hits um just the lazy stuff sitting on the porch reading a book just you know I, I i'm actually not a big fan of summer in a lot of ways i hate when it gets humid not a bit i don't know how people live in places like houston and phoenix in these warm weather cities you're just living in air conditioning and that would drive me crazy so there are some things about summer I don't like, to be honest with you, but man, just to take that breath and enjoy the weather. Golf, of course, we talked about uh, some great golf courses and, and golfing in central New York. I love to play golf whenever possible. So it goes fast, man. 
you know, it's early June before you know it, like two months from today, Syracuse football training camp is going to be back. Right. And we're going to, the fair will be here before you know it. And we're just going to get back into that routine, but you got to enjoy your summer. You got to just shut down, enjoy it, take it easy. Uh, come on. We living in central New York. We got Oneida Lake. We got skinny Atlas Lake. We got the finger lakes nearby. Like, man, there's something to do every day in the summer. Green lakes is a great spot to go. I'm going to leave a few off the list here, but, um, my wife and daughter love to go camping and hiking. I I'll hike any day of the week, not a huge camping guy. I'll tag along once in a while, but just not my thing. Uh, just, you know, start, I've got one of those, um, what are those fire pits called? My wife got it for me for father's day a couple years ago. Oh, I can't remember the name of it. Um, a solo stove. I have a solo stove, sit on the back porch, have a fire, make some s'mores, like just all those things. That I'm forgetting a hundred things here that are going to pop in my head here, but just to name a few, Danny P summertime in central New York, head up to heritage Hill, have a cold one. Look at the best views in central New York. I mean, come on, let's go. You guys brought it amazing questions in this episode. And in part one, if you missed part one, it's in the show notes, go listen to that. I mentioned at the top of the show, thanks to your votes, the first draft we're going to do is i think we've done a couple drafts before but we're going to make this a regular part of the show now we're going to draft the all-time syracuse basketball starting five now keep it in mind this way i'm not saying the best starting five on one team i'm saying all time you get the full player allotment in the history of syracuse basketball so theoretically i could have dave bang and jerry mcnamara in the same backcourt i could have carmelo anthony and Derek coleman on the same team get what we're saying here so that'll come next week please subscribe if you haven't already on spotify on apple on youtube so you don't miss any episodes of syracuse sports we had part one of axe brent anything i talked this week with mike curtis and drew carter we did a nba finals preview drew the play-by-play -play voice of the celtics our old friend mike curtis is now covering uh, the dallas mavericks for the dallas morning news i talked to isis young earlier this week former syracuse basketball player who is a WNBA analyst, just everybody freaking out about women's basketball. <clears throat> Pardon me. And what's going on with Caitlin Clark and everything. We had a great conversation with ISIS about that. So please subscribe. We were saying lazy things to do in the summer. Listen whenever you want. Watch whenever you want on YouTube, right? That's the beauty of Syracuse Sports. Thanks again to our Syracuse Sports Insiders. Sign up today. Just text the word ORANGE to 315-847-3895. All of our questions today for this Axe Brent Anything episode came from our great Syracuse Sports Insiders. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. We will be back next week. And have yourself a great weekend, everybody. We'll talk to you then.